What's up, world? Uh, I just, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. They, 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 they insert here. Yo. It's a terrible game. Bottom line. It's terrible in every way. Graphically, it's terrible. Gameplay is terrible. It's just terrible. Oh, angry Nick mad. That game sucked, and it's gonna suck no matter how many revisions they make, and it just sucked even more because they put a connect with it. Oh, angry Nick mad. Or if there's violence, I'll just laugh and enjoy the fun. Kaz Hazari. Hazar Harari. Kaz Harai. 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 They just kind of got tired of Angry Nick on the first one and said, yeah, I'm gonna pass. But oh, yeah, so I do. It's me, precisely. No. 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 I, I, per- I no. do all my work. No. No. Yeah, I'm you guys are so I don't- cute. Oh, thank you. I try. I mean, let's face it, Mario, and to a lesser extent, Zelda, is what carries Nintendo at this point. Always be radical. I love you, little podcast. You're the bestest thing ever. For the promise of the new Super Smash Brothers and the Zelda game, yes. You will not find a better story presented in any other game genre, in my personal opinion. Like, JRPG have that. They have that story. That's what the entire game felt like. Oh, my God. God, I want to bang my head into a wall. It's a uh, podcast it's just, Can someone remind me? I thought it was a video game podcast. You're listening to the Game Source Podcast. All right, thanks for joining us again uh, on another wonderful episode of the Game Source Podcast. This is episode 126, and we are here in the Student Union Theater at UNLV for the Las Vegas premiere of da-da-da-da, Nintendo Quest. And I know Rob and Jay have heard this like 15 times already, but uh, a year ago when I was talking to Rob and uh, they said they brought this uh, documentary filmmaker in and, you know, he wants to talk about his movie. I'm like, okay, sure, absolutely, gamer movie. We're all on it. And then he told us, hey, you guys, you come on down. You're going to be for the premiere. I'm just like, what'd you say, Nick? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember what I had uh, for breakfast okay, you a week could ago. Just hear the sound of his eyes rolling. So yeah. I think was probably the best way to describe it. And, My uh, reaction was, "I'll believe it when I see it," and yeah. I'm never gonna see it. <laughs> yeah. So um, that was one year ago, at Level Up Expo, uh, and again, shout out to them because they're such great people down there. Uh, but you know, one year later, we're here. Finally. Finally. Yeah. My goodness. And I'm here with uh, Rob and, and Jay. You brought us along and kept your word. That's we right. appreciate it. We, yes. Oh, of course. I've got Angry Nick, OSU Water Polo, and of course the stars. So, writer, director. Who Rob don't want to be stars. Writer, director Rob McCallum, and the video I game am, rock star. I am Jay Bartlett, the collector. There you go. Wonderful to be here. Love oh, yeah, show. Game Source. But he's, I thought he was in the Marvel uh, Cinematic Universe, the collector. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, Jay's getting let's close not, to that. Let's not talk to talk about Marvel right now. Okay. <laughs> My feelings on that. So, how does it feel, guys? I know you were you uh, doing a little bit tidbit earlier, but uh, telling us uh, telling the camera how you feel. But how do you feel? Uh, it's good. Um, even though we've we've done the one screening in LA, this is a whole other monster. It's like the band going on on the road, right? So they'll play in LA one night and they'll play in Chicago the next, and it's completely different because it's a different vibe, a different city. Uh, this one, we know there's going to probably be twice to maybe three times as many people. Wow. It's an afternoon screening, which means the vibe is going to be different, and I think the demographics. I think it's going to be a lot of a lot more gamers than at Beverly Hills. So I'm seeing already, yeah. as far as it's concerned, I'm seeing uh, a lot of gamers come in already. And really yeah, I'm excited to see their reaction. The people so. outside waiting, you know, it, it's a lot of pulp, pop culture shirts. And, you know, There's a lot of Star Wars shirts, which yeah, a lot of Star happy. Wars shirts, a lot of Nintendo shirts. <laughs> I don't feel part of the team in my little button down. <laughs> I got happening here. Yeah, you're a little too professional for I, this, Rob. I'm, I'm wearing, I think, a, a he, yeah, I'm wearing my He-Man appetite for destruction <laughs> paradigm. <laughs> well, uh, Nick was funny because Nick was asking me yesterday, um, "We're going to a film premiere, man. What are, what do you want? What do you think I should wear?" <laughs> um, <laughs> tuxedo man, tuxedo. Yeah, yeah as as, something uh, as long as we get a rest. I want to see Nick in a dress. That yeah. would be new. Uh, well, he wears the bear hat. <laughs> yeah. Body Bear hat and a dress. Bear hat and a dress. Um, but Nick, did you have any questions for I? Well, I mean, uh, outside of uh, obviously you're excited to be here. Oh, um, yeah. Of you course, know. yeah. Jay, yeah. what are your thoughts, man? I'm nervous. Um, this one is going to be twice the size. So my palms are sweaty like I was just telling Rob a few minutes ago. I really want to see people's reactions. I'm, I'm excited. I, Me personally, I want to see the end. I want to see the reactions to the ending of the film. You had a chance uh, a couple days ago to see that from a, uh, you said a smaller sample size, but sure. how'd it go? Oh, it was kick-ass. 
There were so many laughs in the right places, laughs where we didn't expect. Cheers. There was cheering going on. There was clapping. There was, that, yeah. There were, like, vocal comments yelling at the screen towards Jay's decisions. And when, when some games get picked up, you know, <laughs> it'll show on the screen and people were cheering for their favorite titles. That was cool. We didn't we didn't expect that. I think if I if I'll make one pitch based on feedback, a pitch to support the film or go see the film or buy it when it comes on sale, it's that the individual who runs the screening room right on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills yeah. said, ninety nine percent of the stuff I see I hate. And I really don't like documentaries. Let's work together moving forward. Yeah, he really enjoyed the film. That's so awesome. we were just I mean, what what's the family? The fourth generation of yeah, it's fourth generation since this place has been there. It's, they've had that screening room since the sixties. I mean, they had the pictures. Charles Adekoff screening room. Yeah, you name it. Anybody that's ever acted in anything somewhat familiar, they've had pictures with them. Jim Carrey, so Brad Pitt, Matt Damon. For me, Jim yeah, Gino. it hit home seeing our Nintendo Quest now playing poster, and then there's like Harrison Ford and like Brad Pitt and stuff like that. <laughs> and we're just like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Take two so guys next year a... at this time, you guys aren't going to talk to us. You're going to be too big. So no, actually, I'm I'll have my <laughs> agent talk to your agent. We'll do lunch sometime. Yeah, I'll, I'll make the same promise. A year again, whatever we're doing, I'm sure you guys will be involved. And hopefully, we're not going to get the eye rolls or skepticism. <laughs> oh. You guys, I'll just water say polo. It. You I'm, you shove it. I know I'll you're always going to when I see yeah, it. Yeah. You have a, a quality <laughs> show here, and and I really do love it. And that's that's just us being honest. So yeah. Yeah. Well, we anytime, any day, we appreciate it. So how, what was your overall experience filming this? I mean, from beginning, beginning to end. I mean, what you know was it? I'm sure there were a times. lot of it's what we've endured in the last week, road tripping from Canada for the premieres to shooting nonstop the day of the screenings. It's exhaustion, but it's that marathon nostalgia that's hitting at least me again. Like this feels like so familiar working with Jay, except for a lot of it's secondhand now. It's like Jay, I need you to open up. I need you to stand like this. I need soundbite like this. Yeah. So it's becoming much more fluid. We've got. As, as much as we were friends to be able to work together with 30 years of history there, now we've got two years plus of like a working relationship and we can shortcut all And that's really cool too because we can separate the two, which I don't think a lot of people can. Yeah. Um, Even if it's an hour of silence over a cold Bud Light, sometimes that's <laughs> enough just to kind of like switch gears. Yeah. And we're doing a little collecting again, which is nice. We've compiled lists for the power tour of, you know, five or ten games that we're looking for. Nothing to... You know, but expensive. I don't know what's on his list, and he doesn't know what's yeah. on my list. And the idea is that we're going to try to knock off all the games on our list by the end of the summer. So everywhere we're screening the film, and there's 13 cities in total now, we're trying to do some game hunting and see who's in the community of these cities, talking to the game shop owners, talking to the private collectors, just seeing who's out there and what we can find along the way. So, And all of this stuff is being filmed, like I said, and we'll be putting it out for free as promotional for the film, for us, and all the other stuff. No online purchase is allowed. No online purchases, of course. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to finish my list in about three minutes online. Click, 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 click. I won't be able to afford, to go to, I won't be able to, afford to go to the other cities. Oh, is that a spoiler, maybe? What's the story behind that game? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it, it arrived Monday. That's the story. <laughs> the story is UPS. Yeah, UPS arrived and he got angry so, when I didn't answer in time. For, for me, the experience of shooting the movie was one of uh, excitement, fear, uh, I'm feeling like a kid on Christmas morning. Uh, feeling like a kid who you guys remember the people would win like Toys or a shopping spree for like ten minutes. You get to take your card and well, the stuff obviously wasn't free. I'd use my money. It was very much <laughs> like that experience where I was like, wow, my my work day is me going to these shops and trying to find games. Like, how great is that? It was just mm -hmm. it was awesome. There's tons of up and downs <clears throat> in the film. There's almost every day was an emotional ro roller coaster for myself and actually for Rob because there's a lot of stuff. He captured off camera, hmm. um, on camera, but Jay didn't realize the cameras were rolling and still pointing at us. Yeah. He's like, "Let me talk to you off camera." I'd walk away and make sure that we're still rolling so we capture the audio yeah. and get something. There's a, lot, there's a lot of cool moments. In my opinion, not having seen the movie yet, I don't think it mattered. I, I, I don't think that the final destination was where it was. It was the journey that at least you and the Kickstarter we're capturing and I mean yeah for Jay obviously it meant a little bit more to get the whole thing but I, I think for the experience that we're gonna see it that's you know gonna be the ending of the film yeah but it's the, it's the journey that's gonna make the ending 
all the better one way or the other. Oh, you're making me want to talk about it so bad. I can't um, say anything. Right now. <laughs> I will throw something at you. In two hours, yeah. Just I've yeah, been waiting hours, since yeah. I saw the Kickstarter to see the end result. So you well, know. I know we're gonna wrap this up because they got the they got the screening coming <laughs> we up. Got, we got like a hundred people outside the door trying to get in here. We're sitting in the theater it's room like the right now. Dead, right? But I will just say this: that Nintendo Quest is a great experience. I did see the film. I did review it. It is on our. Uh, your game source, in case you missed it, Paige. Um, if you want to read my review of it, uh, I thought it was... Is it spoiler-free? It's spoiler-free. It's an incredible experience, and I just said it was the best movie of this year. So, oh, um, so wow. far. That's amazing. So far. Well, episode yeah. seven's not out yet, so... Yeah, I, I picked the one year with a little bit of competition. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's been a great experience for me to be a part of all of this. We're truly indebted to you both. Oh, uh, we thanks. appreciate your time. You, your patience and your cooperation with us. And again, see you later. It's been awesome. Great. Thanks, guys. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Anytime. Hey, this is Aaron, OSU Water Polo, here with YourGameSource.com. And we are here today with Aaron Pollock with his game Primal Carnage Extinction. Just uh, explain a little bit about um, who you are, what you do, those sort of things. Okay, yeah, I'm the uh, I'm the founder of Circle Five Studios. We um, we're the studio that took over the Primal Carnage brand and put out uh, the second game, Primal Carnage Extinction, uh, in April uh, of this year. Um, basically, we, we we took a brand that a different team had built and really revamped it, coded it from the ground up to make to give it a foundation for doing a lot more. Um, so Primal Carnage Extinction. Uh, you know, has Team Deathmatch and Get to the Chopper, which is the first game I had. We just put out the survival update, which added AI. So now there's a wave-based survival mode. But what is the game? I really haven't said that. Yeah, it's a dinosaur versus human uh, multiplayer game uh, currently on Steam, coming to PS4 later this year. The, um, the nuance is you can play as the dinosaurs, right? You can play as both sides, um, which... So right now there's, uh, there's 10... Uh, playable dinosaurs, five classes with differing amounts of subclasses. And on the human side, there's there's five classes of humans. I don't know if that's ever going to change, but each one of them has you know three weapons, swappable weapon loadout. So as uh, as we progress forward, we're adding more dinosaurs and adding more humans. And you know, so it's a game where you have different types of modes and different types of things, and you pretty much. Uh, but it's team it's team based. So dinosaurs versus humans, generally speaking. So uh, normally, companies don't take over other IPs in the gaming world and do well with them. Um, what has that experience been like for you, uh, working with an established IP and, and putting your own spin on it? Well, I mean, slightly different. So I was I was the co-founder of the first company. Um, really, when we went through a bunch of changes in 2013 with the brand and, and the team, and at the end of all of them, without getting into particulars, we had a completely different set of people that were now working on what started as a patch. It started as a, anyone that's a fan of the game remembers patch 1.3 and then what happened thereafter where we were trying to fix the game and, and basically what we realized after several months was it would be easier to rebuild the entire game from scratch for the most part than it would be to try to dig into code that um, for different reasons had just, just wasn't very malleable, right? Um, and so that's what we did. Uh, there's a lot of, if in hindsight, what would we have done differently sort of things, but uh, the fact is is that, you know, what we have now with, uh, with the game allows us to do some stuff that is very different and just maybe more in line with multiplayer games. So Extinction has um, Steam, works, uh, Steam uh, Marketplace support, so we've got item drops, item crates. Uh, with the next patch, we'll probably have crafting. Um, we've got a few hundred items in the game. This is very different than the first game. Um, some people love the fact that there's all these collectible dino skins. Some people at the moment are, you know, now it's become skin oriented. But um, as far as gameplay itself, uh, we, you know, the game's in a state where getting new features in is, is getting really easy, right? Um, we, we hope that we've hit maybe the, the last part of the long periods of development with the, uh, with the AI. So now that the game has an AI system in place, we might be able to work out more modes where it's, you know, right now the one we have is you play as humans versus waves of waves of AI dinosaurs. Not all that dissimilar than a lot of AI games. But, you know, we're, we're going to hope to get in a mode at some point. 
uh, where you're the dinosaurs and you've got waves of AI humans. Maybe it's maybe it's a hungry, hungry hippos thing where you're T-Rexes and you're scooping up humans, or or you're assaulting the base as a team of uh, dinosaurs and you know um, you're defending against human uh, AI characters that are doing different things to stop you. There's a lot more in terms of like what we can look to in the development community um, in the way of examples of AI, human defense systems, things to build that sort of thing than there ever was for um, AI dinosaurs. Really designing playable dinosaurs and and then making them playable by the, by the, uh, the AI director. There's not a lot of reference points for non-humanoid, um, realistic feeling sorts of, sorts of characters. Yeah. That makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, you can pull from hundreds and thousands of games that have humans in them and, and get that sort of thought process for the AI and things like that. Not very many games where you actually get to play as the dinosaur. Right. And it's properly fun, you know? Fun and balance, right? Balance. Yeah. Balance yeah. is like the, you know, in terms of is where is the game at now within each mode and, and, and really what defines it being uh, more complete or fun or all that. Balance is really essential. And um, with a game like ours, it's not only asymmetric in terms of humans versus dinosaurs, but on the dinosaur side, there's a great amount of asymmetric play going on, right? You've got the raptor, which is stealthy and fast. Um, and I'm gonna probably go with like the main class, the, the original class things, but you know, there's also the over raptor, which has slightly different stats. Um, and that's, uh, it, it, it's ground, it's got the pounce, which is a disabling sort of attack. But then you've got the terror, which is a flyer. You can swoop in and grab something. So it adds aerial gameplay. It's gotta be faster. It's more of a support role and, and getting something like the, the moment that you grab something and how well, how easy it is to do that without being overpowered. You know, that's a very different set of mechanics. And then you've got the, uh, the you know, the, the, the Tyrant class, which now has the T-Rex, the Spino, and we just added the Acrocanthosaurus, um, which those are one hits, you know, kills, stompers, and how you balance making those Tyrants accessible without completely destroying the game, it's, it's a challenge. It's still something that we're figuring out and that will continue to be adjusted with every patch, every couple of months. But, you know, those are really different sorts of characters whereas humans even if you know you compare like this the sniper versus the pyro the, the properties of movement and you know size and health those are all relatively similar yeah you've got 80 percent of it there for you and you only have to tweak a little bit on each one whereas the dinosaur each dinosaur has different movement points and just all sorts of how they react to things so yeah everything everything is very dissimilar not to mention that just generally speaking, getting the look and feel and movement of dinosaurs right is that has to be paramount to our team because that's what defines our brand. That's that's what makes it exciting. It's not just that there's dinosaurs; it's that they're playable. And uh, you know, if you do it, if you do it off even a little bit, your fans rightfully, our fans rightfully, like you know, take issue with us. Yeah. Um, in in the various modes that you have or have planned, are the is there ever going to be one where you feel okay, this dinosaur or human is going to be a little too overpowered for this mode and we're not going to let you play it or we're going to give it lesser stats or is everything pretty much going to be every class with the same stats across, the, the same stats in each mode for that class um, or, or are there going to be tweaks based on the various modes? So it's already the case in like the default settings that the, the generally speaking the, uh, the tyrant class is capped to, I think it's one for every five, uh, every five dinosaurs out there, right? But then, you know, some server admins can get in there and mess with the settings and, and uncap that. And so you'll see, you'll find some non-official servers where it's there's just lots of Acrocanthosaurus running around, biting everybody's heads <laughs> off. But we're 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 gonna riff on that and probably um, uh, with it, with another iteration. I don't know if this will be the next patch or or thereafter. Do something where the tyrant class is unlocked as part of. You know, and, and, and there's a few reasons for that. You know, in part, it's it's to perhaps better refine the balance, like what we're talking just talking about. It's also that you know you'll find some players that just spam the spam the right. You know, like I want to play as a tyrant. You know, which who doesn't want to be a rex and stomping around? Yeah. So something where maybe instead of selecting it, you get an option to choose it mid round, and if you pass on it, it goes to some somebody else. Maybe it's achievement oriented. Um, and this is the sort of thing like when I say the game's now in a place where putting in sort of nuanced features is, is getting really easy. You know, one of 
on a similar point, like in the survival mode, we were finding that the challenges we had with like health and ammo stations, you know, the time, that, which is how, what's in the rest of the game for the most part, where your character to refill ammo or health, they sit at a station, they hold E, that's a little bit slow for what we needed. So now we have item pickups. It took us a day to create in-game floating ammo and health. And that's something that we might want to, you know, port back over to some of the other modes and see if it doesn't affect balance, not having to, you know, that instead of going to the same place, which maybe leads to camping issues, you just see random, uh, you know, floating things that pop up, uh, maybe consistently, maybe sporadically, and um, with with basically maybe days of a little bit of programming and testing, we can see if something that was a problem that we couldn't pinpoint has now been solved just by changing something very small but significant. Yeah, so uh, you said the game officially launched in uh, April. What type of reception are you seeing with the game? So, um, so yeah, we, we, we put it into early access in December, actually, and then it exited in April with what I would say is the, um, the bare minimum viable product, right? Which okay. sometimes we, we, we throw that around, or, or just the shippable product, which means when it launched, from a features perspective, it wasn't all that dissimilar from the first game. From a graphics perspective, it was immensely different. Like, it looked beautiful. From a, the, the new game performs better than the first game did. So, you know, our fans at first, you know, there was mixed in terms of being excited that it was out or this is what I waited for and have to pay for again in some cases. I mentioned that it was, was it start, this game started as a patch, but after a certain amount of time, we realized the amount of work that would go into it and the scope of what we had in mind, this was a different game. So, but when it first came out, you might not be able to tell that. We just put out um, the first patch of, that reflects two months of work that in addition to a variety of just small fixes, rebalances, performance features, you know, a new dinosaur, three new weapons, which when the game first launched, even though we had a system for swappable, a swappable weapon loadout, we only had one weapon per slot, right? Now we actually have a little bit more of that. Um, with with every patch, there's going to probably be a handful of weapons and probably a, a single dinosaur. And then, but the, the sort of jewel of that patch was the AI, right? That's something that really separates it from the first one. And we've seen the numbers in terms of the number of people in the servers, sales and all of that really, go, and attention go up because it's something distinctly different, right? Every patch that we have planned for probably the next six months, maybe every seven to eight weeks, is gonna be similar. It's gonna add something really big, a handful of actual like gameplay choices and selections, another 50 or 60 in-game items, and a bunch of refinements to, to balance. So this is where it's sort of weirdly different than most games, right? It's that we, we, we came out of early access where maybe some people might stay, but we had to do that because being in early access also means you're a little bit hidden. Unless you're like a game like Ark that's just all over the place and big and giant and enormous. <laughs> most games can't afford to stay in early access when they could be exiting it. And, and most of our fans, honestly, like they'd waited two years to see, to, to play this next game. And we wanted to give them at least the first bite of it. Um, so I would say reception, I mean, we're getting, Steam says it's mostly positive, right? It's about 75 out of 100. Um, but we, it's going to be one of those games that we hope people come back to every few months because, you know, it's going to be really different every couple of months. Um, and that's... That's the way. It would be awesome, right, if we had the resources to double the size of our team and, and just speed up all of this stuff. But we don't. Um, but, you know, the next patch, for instance, we're working really hard on a level up, right? Um, yeah. That's always fun. So, like, there's some features of our game that I think, like, call back to older PC games. That's, that's one of them. I mean, we have land support. What games have land support anymore? You know, like, proper, you can play it offline. There are even there are ways that you can get it to run without having to even go through an offline Steam setting, um, because we care about those gamers and we like we remember, we remember that old style of gaming. Um, we work with 150 LAN university groups across the country and 50 conventions, all of most of whom don't have any. So this is a game that you can play without, you know, needing the online support. Yeah, yeah, that's it's. I love those classic games. <laughs> just just being able to go over to a buddy's house, hook up two computers, and just play against each other is not something you can do anymore because you have to... Every computer has to own it through Steam and all that. And it's just so many hoops anymore to play just with a friend face-to-face -face or 
at least in the same yelling distance in many cases. But yeah, yeah, man, university's setup is, is nice too, getting in on um, land parties there. Um, yeah, there's lots of gaming groups out there that never hear from the studios who make the games that they play. And, um, and it's so easy, really, to, to reach out and find them. And I, I mean, I think it is the in-person um, experience. You know, online's great, right? Not knocking it, you know. We, that's how most that's how you play your games usually. Yes. But that's what makes it special when you actually get together and you can see, you know, what's I mean, that's what that's why we watch esport tournaments, which Absolutely. is actually like a market that we hope with like stat tracking maybe down the road to um, to break into. Um, our game I, I would say like it's a fun game to watch. It's a fun game when you get killed as a human, when you get even if even if it's asymmetric right now, let's just say. If you get eaten by a Rex and like see your your body get you know it's fun right how is that not enjoyable exactly. um, it's That's living Jurassic Park you know um, yeah. or vice versa or being the Spinosaurus and you know scooping somebody up or a raptor tearing someone down like mauling them on the ground we want to we've, we've tried hard and we're going to keep um, improving on ways to make the game watchable really you know satisfying uh, to watch as much as it is to play because um I don't know, that's an experience I think that as the games industry we need more of. Oh yeah, because I, I mean, no matter how many hours you put into a game, you're only going to learn what you can learn but by watching someone else play. You know, they think differently from you and they have totally different strategies. So it, if it's not fun to watch, I'm probably going to give up on it eventually because I just, you hit that plateau of, okay, I can't learn anymore. Unless they put something else big out, it, it's not quite as fun. So yeah, I, I mean, I love playing games in person with people. Um, that, that's most of my best gaming memories are not online. It's face to face, talking with somebody. You know, oh my god, I can't believe you just did that. And, you know, they know exactly what you're talking about, and it's not over. You know, Skype or MSN or if we're gonna be really old ICQ. You know, something like that. You know, it, it's awesome to do stuff face to face now. Well, it's and it's it's community building, right? Oh, and that's absolutely. and that's what drive. That's a huge driving part of our industry in, in the strongest ways. Is you know the games that, like some of the gaming communities, like Smite or Gigantic or you know uh, Eve. It's it's not strictly their online stuff. It's the fact that they've been able to host events that bring people together, and they know that's a really big part of making a game enjoyable, like for a long period of time, as opposed to like for six months before it's receded into nothing. And yeah. a multiplayer game, right, you can't, it's not about getting people to play it once and then play for, you know, a month and then leave it alone. Like, your brand will die. Absolutely. You've got to have that. new players replacing the old ones, old players coming back once in a while, yeah. And, and we have a player base that, like, we have a lot of people that have put in 300, 500 hours over a few months or a thousand hours between both games. We want to hang on to those long-term players uh, because... You know, it's gonna be it's gonna be four or six months before our game is. I don't want to say perfect because no game ever is, but I would say just even in, in, a, in a much better state. It's it's in a great state. I, it's, it's a pretty great state right now. But I guess my point is um, um, that I think for like the games industry, right? I'm gonna speak high about the games industry, right? For us to like advance in esports and bring games to people that it might not already reach, it's got to be enjoyable for the people that don't play games that aren't playing Primal Carnage, that are coming with the person that's playing. And when we bring our games to shows, you know, you see six-year-olds playing with 20-year-olds playing with 50-year-olds and their parent, the people that aren't playing watching it. We've done things to try to make it, um, ex like, like we don't have human-on-human -human, you know, killing, right? We don't have, we might have dinosaur versus dinosaur modes in the future, but we probably won't have human versus human. One, because everybody else has done it. Right? Why, why What's the point there? of a dinosaur game if you don't have the dinosaurs in right. that mode, too? I, I, I mean, you know. Yeah. It, it would be easy to create, like, uh, a very, you know, traditional capture the flag game, right? But why would we do that? Other people have great things. We're a smaller indie team. Why go there? And it's also because, you know, as soon as you put guns in the hands of two human teams, they're shooting at each other, you suddenly make it maybe not as palatable for some audiences. Absolutely. Um, you know. Nothing against violence games, but if we're able to, like, hold the widest it possible... It also lets you stand apart from all those games that do do that. You, can, you know, we're not... We haven't at least gone there, and we don't plan to at the moment. And, and you 
different than everybody else, and anything that sets you apart is always a good thing in the industry. So we, we, we can hear uh, we can hear a young child that hasn't played Primal Carnage yet and wants to. Clearly, clearly. Um, but yeah, no, that's it's. We try to find ways to stand apart. Um, you know, as far as other things like what we're going for with our game. It's a retro style, right? It's there's a lot of there's an increasing number of dinosaur games out there, and that's great. There weren't enough dinosaur games out there five years ago, which is why we, you know, it's why Lucor Media went after the, doing that with the first game. But I would say most dinosaur games that are out there, not all, like take themselves are going for a semi-serious or realistic appearance. Uh, you know, and actually, that's not just dinosaur games. It's lots of games. Games are getting yeah, grittier, games deeper, everywhere. and longer. I would say, like, our inspirations are, like, you know, aside from Jurassic Park, because, you know, if, if you make a dinosaur game, uh, and you're, you're inspired by that, you're an idiot. Right? Yeah, then you made a bad <laughs> game, right? Um, I would say G.I. Joe, right? Like, that's for me personally. G.I., you know, or, or brands of, like, the 90s that took a concept and they took it everywhere. They took it into all possible environments. They, they made it, you know, they, uh, they went into space. Who knows where we might go with dinosaurs? But I mean, that's just thematic. That's thematic overlay, right? Where what we have is you can play as dinosaurs, and it's fun to imagine all the places we can take that. And we don't have to take it seriously because that's not the type of game we are. We don't need to have a. I mean, or we don't. It's not like we don't need to. We don't have a campaign or a fixed story that, you know, well we can't do that because that would go against the canon. Like, they're, we wanted to make something that was fun, that we could play with. When, particularly when we created Extinction, something that like, you know, we could do different things with and maybe have fun with as developers and hopefully players too. That's the level editor, right? That's giving, that's giving players the power to see what they can do. Absolutely. It's, it's always one of the most fun games and one of the most fun things in uh, shooters is to, to build the, the level and see how hard it actually is. Um, to, to do it instead of just, you know, complaining on forums going, please add this, please add this, please add this, and the designers who work with the game are like, yeah, that's not going to work. Well, when you have that level editor, it's like, hey, go out and show me a working model of it, and, you know, we, we can riff on it. If, if you've got something that, that's good, others can riff on it. And it's collaborative at that point more than just, you know, noobs crying on a forum. Yeah, one of the games that like has inspired me the most in the last year or two was, was GTA, was GTA V. Um, I loved when I started seeing on Rooster Teeth uh, and other channels like these sort of uh, achievement hunters or wacky things or people taking advantage of, of this, the variety of things they could do in the game to make their own mini games, even beyond the mini games that GTA provided. And you know that's because. It was it was a tool set. I, I remember thinking uh, before, like going like two years ago, this is an esport that's waiting to happen. People just creating ways to challenge each other and sort of challenge each other competitively. Like similarly, you know, with Primal Carnage, you could see something where people build their own plot, their own level and try to do a speed run as a raptor because that's got the ability. The raptor's got some interesting abilities to like uh, almost like parkour. Like you can you can target a certain spot and land on it, and how fast can you get from A to B? You, know, you could design your own race track, right? It'd be really easy. Um, you could set up a flight simulator for the Terra, for the Pteranodon, you know? Uh, just, I'm not sure how you would do that yet, but I think it could be done. And I think that when you get people excited about sort of throwing a hand into something that's fun to play and fun to watch, and, and that's part of it, then you can showcase kind of their ideas. You, you, you've created something. Is that something you guys hope to support, like by running um, contests? You know, hey, whoever makes the, the, the best Raptor track, you know, we'll put it in the game so that everybody downloads it and give you credit for it, you know? Um, is that something, maybe not short term, but like a long term goal for y'all? Yeah. Um, that's definitely something that we're. Uh, that we, we, we definitely want to find different ways to incentivize and motivate people. Certainly the credit and getting something in. I mean, our doors are pretty open, right? We built our team off of, off of, off of fans in many cases saying they wanted to, to help and uh, how can they help and realizing that we need them. It's not just that we want them, but we need them. 
and I think that that's that where like for what we hope for this brand that could be said more broadly about our fan base with stuff like you just mentioned um, so whether it's getting in the game or finding through some of our like hardware sponsors or other sponsors something to reward uh, you know our fans with like you know, or, or some of the merch that we have we've got 3d prints we want to find ways to get people to to do what's fun but to, where, where it requires work, right I mean the whole the whole discussion recently about you know Skyrim and, and, uh, and Valve support, support for mods, um, no matter where you landed on like, how Valve did it and how they should do it and all that, it really surrounds trying to find ways to reward, um, to better reward mod, uh, 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 modders for, for, for contributing substantially to like, what, the, what the product is. Is it the majority of it? No, I don't think anyone would argue that. But... I don't think that the games that games like Skyrim um, would be entirely what they are without, you know, the that community. Yeah, yeah. Um, certainly not like some of the mo- some of the retro games that we love the most, like Doom. Like some of the things that have shaped the industry have come from modders, and in fact, like a lot of our team comes from the modding community. So I think that we're all very excited to see what happens when we put that in the hands of people. Yeah. That's- typical of most developers you start out as a modder on something when you're younger and as you grow up you're like yeah i love this let's get a job doing it hope the pieces fall into place it's, it's, i I'll talk to a lot of people that that's where they started you know they were doing mods on starcraft 2 or, or not 2 starcraft and brood war and things like that and then they're like oh i have this idea for a game and they go they're either an indie developer or things like that so it's definitely one of those cool to support them because, you know, later, 10 years down the line, that could be your next employee, you know? Something along those lines. Um, All right, our, our level or design. your competitor, which is, is also a good thing because it pushes you guys to do better. Here, here's, yeah, well, yeah, all, all of those things are true. Like, here's a quick story about our, our lead level designer, our lead creative director, actually, um, uh, John Vincise, who uh, was a modder, uh, was a source modder, whose levels are, I, I would say, were fairly well known. Uh, it goes by APOC. Um, out of Ketchikan, Alaska, right? Um, he found our way onto the team through a string of other modders and people that were on our team, and um, you know, eventually, sort of, sort of started as an intern and worked his way up to basically being one of the two main leads on the game, um, and is now also based in Vegas. But in terms of breaking into an industry, when you know you don't have, you didn't have professional training or a slew of degrees or anything like that, he was a modder um, in Alaska. Breaking into the games industry, uh, you know, I remember when we went out to a show and he gave a talk about modding, and people that were in the audience knew his levels, knew his levels from, you know, from source, um, and he was surprised by that. But you know, that's what this space gives artists and developers that, um, you know, we as the gaming game development community, I think, have to protect that. And, you know, and we are. I think. I think that there's more and more tools. I think Epic's done a great job. Um, there's more and more places you can buy assets. You can get into making your ideas real faster and faster these days. And um, I hope that we're a big part. I mean, I hope that we can play as big as a uh, part of that as we can. Yeah. So um, right now you're out on PC. Do you have any intentions to expand to any other markets? Yeah, we, we're on PC. We are actively working on PS4. We have been for a bit. Um, it, it'll be out this year. We haven't established a firm date, but we've got, um, we just announced the Panic Button Studios. They're a veteran team that's contributed uh, work in, uh, in different amounts to about 100 titles. They're on PS4 with us, so we're excited about that. We might be on other consoles, we don't know quite yet. A lot of a lot of this thing with this brand is, we'll see how it goes, and... One step at a time. We'll take it as far as we can. Absolutely, that, that's always the best way to do it, because the greatest plans always... Uh, have to be changed. That is game development right there. Yep. Um, this is uh, Aaron OSU Water Polo. We are here with Primal Carnage Extinction at the uh, amazing, amazing Comic Con in Las Vegas. Amazing Las Vegas Comic Con at the uh, South Point Hotel. Um, thank you very much for your time, Aaron. Oh, my pleasure. Have a great day. Thanks.